As I mentioned in my last video, I recently picked up a new laptop so that I could do some couch-based editing and the occasional game or two. Unfortunately for my budget, uh, all you can get in that sort of price range is incredibly gamer aesthetic focused laptops, which have some incredible hardware in them. However, their thermal management and all of that isn't crash hot. So to protect me, I've decided to build a lap desk. This is quite a simple single board with some ventilation holes, some artwork and an integrated mouse pad. Because this is such a simple process, the process to make it is a little bit back to front. I'd already cut down the plywood to size so I could start on the final details like rounding over all the edges at the router table. Since it's birch ply, it's already pretty well sanded, so I can jump straight to 220 grit. The corners were radiused by hand with just sandpaper. Then I could apply two coats of water-based polyurethane, sanding with 220 grit in between. I'll be using a paint mask before carving, and while it does adhere okay to wood, it adheres much better to sealed wood. Normally I'd seal with blonde de wax shellac, but I'm completely out of that. Water-based poly dries so quickly that I was able to get both coats fully cured in one day. The paint mask is cut to size, then slowly peeled off and pressed onto the surface. I find using a roller is the best way to get it to stick properly. Before somebody jumps in and says they don't have a CNC so they can't do this, well that's not entirely true. I printed out a copy of my design and stuck it down onto some MDF to show that you can do it with just a trim router and the same V-bit. The results won't be the same but you can get a pretty close match. I'd recommend using a router with lines and removing the front plastic guard as it can cause some parallax issues as you can see here. Don't use BVA to glue the paper down, it requires a lot of sanding to remove. I want to briefly talk about the design and the process of drawing it to generate the G-code. The design comes from Haman Shu, a Japanese book on waves and ripple design. The book has been used as reference for inspiration and guidelines for adorning wares for over 100 years. It is now in public domain, so I'll have links in the description below. Using Illustrator, I was able to make the lines with the fairy to look more like natural brush strokes. After doing that, make sure to expand the objects as V-Carve can't properly interpret the line widths otherwise. The process of v-carving works on a closed line vector. The alternative is just tracing on the line, but that won't give us a variable depth or get right into the corners of the lines. For the border, it's just a rectangle, so it gets a set depth carving, but the waves are all variable depth and width, hence the need for v-carving. The preview process in v-carve isn't super fast, but it is pretty accurate, and that was really key in being able to design this and see how it was going to look in reality, whether the lines were too wide or whether they'd come out at all. Watching a CNC can be kind of boring, so this is sped up. The design is carved with two bits, a 90 degree v-bit which takes care of the decorative details. 60 degrees would be fine too, but you'd need to go much deeper to handle the wider lines, or have more passes. That can be sped up a little bit by using a clearing bit, but I didn't want to. The through holes were all cut using an eighth inch spiral down cut bit. Up cut and straight bits are pretty aggressive on paint masks, but the down cut behaves amazingly. After carving, I went straight to some black spray paint. As you can tell, I don't like spray paint. I'm considering an airbrush, so if you use airbrush for woodworking, let me know in the comments what I should be looking for. After the paint was dried, the most fun bit ever, according to Natalie, was peeling off the spray mask. She was overjoyed that I was happy to let her peel it.
So this has come up super nice. Unfortunately, there are a few things that have gone wrong. They're not deal breakers, but unfortunately I can't blame anyone but myself. So let's go through them. So first off, these are meant to be holes. They're meant to be through holes. Turns out when you cut a nine millimeter piece of plywood and you tell your CNC to cut a nine millimeter piece of plywood, you need to make sure that it's actually nine millimeters. Uh, I don't know whether it's a combination of the film and the polyurethane on it or whether it's just expanded a little bit over time, but this measures in at 9.2 millimeters. So unfortunately it hasn't cut all the way through. However, you can see uh, really quite clearly, particularly with the black paint, where those holes are. So it's gonna be pretty easy to actually clear that up and I can do that with hand tools very easily and relatively quickly. The second issue is a twofold problem but also kind of isn't an issue. So we've got this line here, isn't quite as opaque as it could be. That's because I was a little bit too impatient and didn't want to be bothered coming back and putting a second coat of paint on. As it turns out, that's actually not as big a deal as it could have been. The whole style was meant to look more natural brush strokes. That's why the lines have these uh, different shapes to them. They're not just a single thickness line. So that works out really well. The other issue is where the paint mask failed or where I should have put on more polyurethane after carving and there's been some paint bleeding. So right here is probably the best example of both of that. You can see the paint has bled into the green a little bit. That's because normally what I do after carving is throw down a layer of shellac, but I'm out of shellac so I've been using that polyurethane and I didn't want to put in another coat of polyurethane and that's how it goes. The other issue is where the paint mask has just lifted during carving, so when I've painted over it, it's created a much thicker line. This could have been avoided by using a stronger tack, or stronger initial tack paint mask, or giving it more time to tack up a bit more. Both of these issues are very similar, and they'll be addressed by giving this a light sand with some 220 grit sandpaper. For the mouse pad, I found the cheapest neoprene non-edge stitch mouse pad at EB Games. It happened to be a massive desk pad and I only needed a fraction. A fresh sharp blade in a utility knife made easy work of this. Anything with a stitched edge I feared would fray too much. To stick it down, I'm using spray adhesive on the mouse pad only. It's not holding up any real forces, so if I need to remove it down the track, having it on one side should let me do that. On both would be permanent. Although this is a very simple project, I am very happy with how it looks and moderately happy with how it works. The design I quite like, it took a while to draw up, but I should have paid a little bit more attention and added more ventilation holes at the top in particular. If we look on the underside of my laptop, the two fans, intake fans are there. It does, however, mean that it's not sitting on my lap or any soft surface, so it does vent considerably better. So with increased ventilation and the integrated mouse pad, I can easily play Overwatch at 120 frames a second and have no issue whatsoever. I'm not getting scolded. The reason for the design, even though it's covered up most of the time, is that I could essentially hang this on the wall, pick it up when I want to use it. I most likely won't. The mouse pad's not quite as uh, nice looking. However, it is something that I could explore down the track, having functional artwork. If you're interested in the artwork, it was something that I drew up. Um, I'll have a link in the description below to the PDF and other artwork, should you want to do something with it. Thanks for watching.